A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy. Now before getting into the news article discussion, I have a very good announcement for you. See, clearing prelims is a mammoth task for many. But why worry when you have Shankar IAS Academy? See, our pre-storming program is aimed to facilitate this process. Pre-storming is the most reliable prelims test series offered by Shankar IAS Academy. Already two batches are going on successfully. Now for those who have missed to enroll in these batches, a third chance is awaiting. Yes, pre-storming batch 3 is starting on November 9th. The first test in this batch will commence on 20th November. Like the other batches, it will also have 66 tests. So go and register today to enhance your prelims score. So with this announcement, let us move on to the Hindu newspaper analysis for today. The list of articles are displayed here for your reference. You can go through it. Today, let us start our news article discussion with this previous year question. It is the seventh question in the set A of 2016 UPSC preliminary paper. So, what does the question ask about? The question is asking about the purpose of Uday scheme. So, to answer this question correctly, you have to have an idea about what is this Uday scheme. See, Ujwal Discom Assurance Yojana, which is shortly known as Uday, is a scheme which was introduced by the Ministry of Power in 2015. Why was it introduced? It was introduced for the revival of the debt land and power distribution companies which is shortly known as DISCOMS. Apart from this, this scheme also envisages financial turnover, operational improvement, reduction of cost of generation of power of the power distribution companies. Also, it strives for development of renewable energy and energy efficiency and conservation. So, from this you can easily arrive at the answer. The correct answer here is option D which says that the purpose of this scheme is providing for financial turnover and revival of power distribution companies. So, now using this as an opportunity, let us know a few more facts about this Uday scheme. See, this scheme is optional for the states which means they are not mandatory. Under the scheme, the state government will have to take over 75% of debt of the power distribution companies as on 30th September 2015 for over a two-year period. See, in this 75% of debt, 50% of debt shall be taken over in 2015-16 and 25% of debt can be taken over in 2016-17. So again why this is done? This is mainly to revive the debt land and discoms. Here the most important thing that you have to remember is the debt taken over by the state as per the Uday scheme will not be included in the calculation of fiscal deficit of respective states in the financial year 2015-16 and 2016-17. So this is about Uday scheme. Now you have to be very cautious here. Solving a question does not alone include finding the right answer. It is also about eliminating the wrong answer. So let us see the other options also. Now look at this first option. It says that the purpose of Uday scheme is to provide technical and financial assistance to startup entrepreneurs in the field of renewable source of energy. Is this is right? No. See, even though Uday scheme strives for development of renewable energy, it does not provide any financial assistance to startup entrepreneurs. So, this statement is actually wrong. Now, let us look at the second option. It says that the purpose of Uday scheme is to provide electricity to every household in the country by 2018. See, this option is talking about Saubhagya scheme or the Pradhan Mantri Sahaj Bijli Hargar Yojana. It was launched in 2017 with an objective to provide electricity to all household by December 2018. And it was not the objective of Uday scheme. So this option is absolutely wrong. Now let us look into the third option. It says that the purpose of Uday scheme is to replace the coal based power plants with natural gas, nuclear, solar, wind and tidal power plants over a period of time. See this option is also absolutely wrong because in India for electricity we rely more on coal based power plants. So replacing it with other plants by a single scheme is not a viable option. But it can be done by long term policies. So this option is also wrong. So this is how you solve a question in your question paper. I also suggest you to not overthink. If you have found the right answer, just check the other options also. Okay. Now let us move on to the next question. 
Now this question is the eighth question in set A of 2016 preliminary paper. By reading this question, you can understand that this question is about IFC masala bonds. Now look at this first statement. What does it say? It is saying that IFC, that is International Finance Corporation, which offers the IFC masala bonds, is an arm of the World Bank. See, this statement is actually correct. Since it is a factual statement, if you know the fact only, you can answer the question. See, we know that the World Bank Group is one of the world's largest source of funding and knowledge for developing countries. It consists of five institutions. They share a commitment to reduce poverty, increase shared prosperity and promoting sustainable development. The five institutions include IBRD, which is International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, then IDA, International Development Association, then IFC, International Finance Corporation, then MIGA, Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, and ICSID, which is International Center for Settlement for Investment Disputes. So, if you know this, you can easily come to the conclusion that statement 1 is correct. Now, coming to the second statement, this statement says that IFC Masala bonds are the rupee denominated bonds and are a source of debt financing for the public and private sector. See, to know whether the statement is right or wrong, you should know about the masala bond offered by IFC first. So, what are these masala bonds? See, masala bonds are bonds issued outside India by an Indian entity or corporate. So, both the government and private entities can issue these bonds. Now, why do they issue bonds? They issue it to raise funds from foreign investors. This is not something new. Indian companies have been raising debt from overseas market for decades through bond offerings. And know that these borrowings through bond offerings are denominated in dollar or other currencies. Masala bonds on the other hand or rupee denominated bonds that is the fund would be raised from overseas market in Indian rupees. So in simple words they are debt instruments which help to raise money in local currency from foreign investors. So with this information you can easily say that statement 2 is also correct. So the correct answer for this question is option C both 1 and 2 because both the statements here are correct. Now moving on, let's look into the ninth question of set A in 2016 prelims question paper. What is this question is about? It is about the taxation system prevalent at the time of Krishna Deva, the ruler of Vijayanagar. So by seeing the question itself, you can see it is a two statement question and it is a bit factual. You have to know both the statements are right or wrong to correctly answer the question. So to answer the question, let us see a few facts about Krishna Deva. See, Krishna Deva is also known as Krishna Deva Raya, was the ruler of Vijayanagar Empire from 1509 to 1529. He belongs to the Tuluva dynasty. During his time, he defeated the Sultan of Bijapur, Golconda, and the Bamini, and also the Gajapatis of Odisha. These victories had made him the dominant ruler of the peninsula. He is well known for his administrative policies and architecture. Now, since the question is asking about tax, we'll see particularly about tax system to address the question. See, the land tax was one of the most important source of revenue of Vijayanagar Kingdom. Here, land are divided into four categories for the purpose of assessment, which includes wetland, dry land, orchard and woods. The land tax was levied after a careful measurement of soil and it varied according to the fertility of the soil and the availability of irrigation facilities. How fascinating, right? Note that the land revenue varied for the gross yield. However, in case of failure of monsoon drought or certain other unforeseeable calamities, relief was also given to cultivators. So this is about the land tax. Now talking about the professional tax, See, it was levied on shopkeepers, farm servants, workmen, etc. Then the industrial tax was imposed on private industries. Commercial tax such as levies, duties and customs were also imposed on manufactured articles. Even the tax was also realized on marriages, meetings and social organizations. Tax were paid both in cash and kind. Here, the term kind refers to goods or services. And remember, during Vijayanagar kingdom, four methods of tax collection was prevalent. Firstly, the government appointed its own employee to collect the revenue. Secondly, the government had allotted a particular piece of land to the individual bidder and collected the revenue. 
thirdly the government collected a fixed amount from the group of persons to whom the collection of revenue from the village was entrusted and lastly the nayaks had been appointed by the government as head of the provincial units then the nayaks in return rendered military service and also paid a fixed revenue to the king so this is all about the tax system now look at this question the first statement says that the tax rate on land was fixed depending on the quality of the land just now we discussed about that right so this statement is actually correct now look at the second statement this statement says that private owners of workshops paid an industrial tax this also we saw just now the tax was also paid by workers in the name of professional tax and tax was also imposed on industries in the name of industrial tax as we know the industries were mostly owned by private owners so they had paid the tax to the government so here the correct answer for the question is option c both 1 and 2 because both the statements are correct Now take a look at this news article. See this news article talks about a new plan for the rejuvenation of Panamaram heronry which is present in the Malabar region of Kerala. See this article says that this tiny islet is a haven for globally threatened waterfowls. This includes the black-headed ibis, purple heron, large egret, pond heron, night heron and little cormorant. So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us learn few points about Panamaram heronry. Before that, what does this term heronry means? See, heronry typically means a place in which herons breed. Here, herons are nothing but a group of water fowls. Know that water fowls is a term which comprises of all the birds which predominantly live near water. Okay, they have webbed feet. and are generally better swimmers with waterproof wings now let us move on to the location of this place see the panamaram heronry is one of the less known heronry present in kerala it is located near the panamaram town this town lies 650 meter above the sea level it is located in the district of vayanad in the northeastern part of kerala remember it is a small natural islet that covers approximately 1 acre formed by the bifurcating flow of panamaram river here note that panamaram river is a tributary of kabini which subsequently flows into karnataka to join kaveri at mysore also remember vegetation of the heronry is mandated by bamboos and rest of the sandy ground is covered with grass weeds and bushes This area usually receives rainfall both from southwest and northeast monsoons and the heronry supports a huge waterfowl population. Here note that if the heronry is declared as conservation reserve then it will be able to receive a sum of money for its conservation from both central and state governments. So this is all about Panamaram heronry. I hope today you learned in brief about heronry. Along with that we saw about the location of this Panamaram heronry. So these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion. See this article from the text and context says that India's apex regulator of genetically modified plants and food products has approved the environmental release of Dara mustard hybrid lavin. And if approved for commercial cultivation it would be the first genetically modified food crop available to Indian farmers. and this is what this article is related to so in this discussion we are going to see about the genetically engineered variant of mustard and the controversy regarding it before that the syllabus relevant to this news article is highlighted here for your reference just go through it first of all let us see about the genetically engineered variant of mustard see it is called dara mustard hybrid lavin and it is shortly represented as dmh lavin As we all know DMH11 is a hybrid variant of mustard it was developed by researchers at the Center for Genetic Manipulation of Crop Plants at the University of Delhi Now let us see how it was developed See DMH1 is a hybrid variant that was developed within transgenic technology A quick note for you here transgenic refers to an organism or cell whose genome has been altered by the introduction of foreign DNA sequences from another species by artificial means so dmh1 is not developed by this method and it was approved for commercial release in northwest india in 2005 to 2006 but there is a major drawback here 
See, scientists said that this technology is not feasible enough to consistently produce hybrid mustard. This is because several mustard varieties in India are self-pollinating plants. So the challenge for plant breeders here is it will be difficult to cross different mustard variants and it will also be difficult to induce desirable traits. So to enable crossing with the different variants and to restore the desirable trait and to enable speed production, we have to turn off the self-pollinating trait and this needs manipulation. So DMH11 was developed. It is a result of a cross between two variants. One is Varuna and the other one is Early Hera 2. The natural cross between these two variants is difficult. Why? Just now we saw right? It is because the mustard variants in India are self-pollinating. That is why natural cross between these two varieties is difficult. So the cross was done after introducing genes from two soil bacterium called Barneys and Barstar. See Barneys gene in Varuna induces a temporary sterility. This helps in restricting the natural self-pollination. And Barstar genes in Hera blocks the effect of Barneys allowing the plant to produce seeds. And the result is DMH11. See here the number 11 refers to the number of generations after which desirable traits are manifested and this DMH11 has better yield and it is also fertile. So DMH11 is a transgenic crop because it uses foreign genes from a different species. So this is about DMH11. Now let us see why researchers and scientists are working on transgenic hybrid variant like this. See the answer to this question is very simple. They are working on it because these transgenic hybrid variants are better than other varieties. See the trials conducted by the Indian Council of Agricultural Research that is ICAR suggests that DMH11 has 28% higher yield than its parent Varuna and it was found to be 37% better than the local varieties that are considered to be the best in different agroclimate zones. And this DMH11 signals the success of the Barney's Barstar system that can act as a platform technology to develop newer hybrids. Apart from this, there is also another reason. See, mustard is cultivated in 6 to 7 million hectares during the Rabi winter season. It is predominantly cultivated in Rajasthan, Haryana, Punjab and Madhya Pradesh. Despite this, India imports around 55 to 60 percentage of its domestic edible oil requirement. I'll give you a data. According to the National Academy of Agricultural Sciences, India imported around 13.3 million tons of edible oil in 2020 to 21 and this cost India of about 1,17,000 crore rupees. So what do you think is the reason for this large imports despite having large production area? See the primary reason is low productivity. Only 1 to 1.3 ton per hectare yield is produced and this yield has been stagnant for over two decades. On the other hand, hybrid mustard and rapeseed or the dominant form of oil seeds in Canada, China and Europe. So India is importing edible oil from these countries. From this we can say that the only way to improve India's productivity is to have more mustard hybrids. Better yielding hybrids will help to meet India's rising edible oil import bills. So these are the two reasons why researchers are working on hybrid variants. Now you may think if it has benefits then what is the controversy that is prevailing around GM crops? See there are two main reasons why transgenic mustard are in use. The first reason is the use of genes that are foreign to the species. So the activists are saying that it will create adverse impacts. And secondly, activists say that GM mustard plants may dissuade bees from pollinating the plant and this will cause major environmental catastrophes. So these are the two controversies prevailing around GM mustard. So now what will happen? See this is not the first time that the GEAC has cleared the environmental release of GM mustard. In 2017 also GEAC cleared it. But the process was stopped after a case was filed in the Supreme Court. See the government specifically the environment ministry also didn't officially support the GM mustard. Other instances like this involves BT Brinjal, 
so it is the first transgenic food crop and it was cleared by the GEAC in 2009 but this process also was put on hold by the government on the grounds that more tests were needed now that currently the only transgenic gene grown in India is BT cotton now coming to the question what's next or the what is the way forward see the approval from the GEAC only allows the DMH11 to be grown in fields that too under the supervision of ICAR and the final say is in the hands of the government so we have to wait and see what will happen will it become the first transgenic food crop that gets nod for commercial release or will it get the support of the government or will activists support the commercial release of GM crops we don't know but we'll discuss about it when changes happen so that's all about this news article discussion in this news article discussion we saw in detail about dmh 11 and some of the controversies associated with it so these learn to points now let us move on to the next news article discussion now take a look at this news article it reports about the indian sugar mills associations proposal to the union government to re-revise the price of ethanol to make the production of it more remunerable to the mill owners so this is the crux of the news article given here but now let me ask you all a question why ethanol production is given so much importance nowadays see the answer lies in the growing importance of ethanol as a circular fuel so to understand the importance of ethanol let us first see what is ethanol see ethanol is a fuel made from corn or other plant materials other plant materials here include bagasse of a sugar can or sorghum barley etc here note that most of the ethanol production in india takes place from sugar cane related compounds since ethanol has been made from the remains of food crops it can be termed as a circular fuel also note that ethanol can be termed as a perfect example of energy from waste concept now recently union government has preponed india's 20 percentage ethanol blending target by five years from 2030 to 2025 this has been done to promote sustainable environmental practices so with this basic understanding now let us see some of the advantages of using ethanol see we know that india is major import dependent country in regards to its fossil fuel requirements right this in turn significantly is reducing the foreign exchange reserves of india so blending a certain amount of ethanol will bring down the cost of import of fossil fuels this is the first advantage other than this india also faces the risk of high fuel prices during the times of constrained fuel supply in the international market this is particularly true for the current times as india is experiencing high inflation due to rise in global crude oil price owing to the ukraine war this type of imported inflation can be reduced if india can increase ethanol blending also note that carbon dioxide that is co2 released when ethanol is used in vehicles is offset by the co2 captured when crops used to make the ethanol or grown so as a result vehicles running on high level blends of ethanol produce less net co2 than conventional vehicles which only run on fossil fuel now coming to the benefits to the farm society see ethanol blending can help sugarcane farmers and sugar mill owners to gain from this initiative because they will be able to get a good price for their products so these are all some of the advantages associated with blending ethanol with conventional fuels in india so in this news article discussion we saw in detail about what is ethanol and why it is felt very important at this point of time and we also saw some of the advantages of ethanol usage so these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion now look at this article from text and context article it speaks about the disqualification of legislators who are convicted on criminal charges so in this context let us learn some of the points given in the news article firstly let us see why this topic is in news see recently legislators from Uttar Pradesh were convicted on criminal charges and one of them was disqualified the first one who was convicted and also disqualified is Azam Khan he was the MLA of Samajwadi party for Rampur 
See, he was sentenced to a three-year jail term for making an inflammatory speech in 2019. Note that he has been convicted under three sections. That is, section 153A of the IPC, which deals with promoting enmity between two groups. Then. Section 505 of the Indian Penal Code, which deals with statements conducive to public mischief, and finally under Section 125 of the Representation of People Act 1951, which deals with the offence of promoting enmity between classes in connection with the election. See, according to Section 8 of the RPA, that is Representation of People Act 1951, a legislator who is convicted under any one of the section which we have seen now, then he or she must be disqualified. So, according to this Section 8 of the RPA only, the Assembly Secretariat declared that MLA Azam Khan is disqualified. Then the other MLA who is convicted but not disqualified is Vikram Singh Saini from Katauli. constituency of up see he was sentenced to 2 years imprisonment in connection with the muzaffar nagar rights case of 2013 however he was not been disqualified till now so because of these two cases only suddenly the question of whether conviction attract disqualification is in news so now let us see when does conviction attract disqualification See again section 8 of the RPA 1951 deals with the disqualification of legislators on conviction for certain offences. Now let us see the offences mentioned under section 8 that entails disqualification. Firstly major IPC offences are included like the two sections we have seen earlier that is section 153A and section 505. then the other sections such as section 171e which deals with offence of bribery then the section 171f which deals with offence of undue influence or personation at an election and some other offences under ipc like electoral offences offences related to rape and cruelty to women by husband have also been included then section 135 which deals with offence of removal of ballot papers from polling station and the section 135a which deals with offences of booth capturing are also included as offences under section 8 of the rpa see beside ipc and rpa the serious provisions of special laws are also included like the protection of civil rights act customs act unlawful activities prevention act the foreign exchange regulation act etc then laws for prevention of sati corruption terrorism and insult to national flag and national anthem are also included as offenses in this group so these are all categories of offenses mentioned under section 8 of the rpa that entails disqualification regardless of the quantum of punishment and remember section 8 clause 1 of the rpa provides two categories of disqualification based on the above offenses the first category is that if a person is convicted of the above said offenses and sentenced to only fine then he or she has been disqualified to become a legislator for a period of 6 years from the date of such conviction then the second category is that if a person is convicted on the above said offenses and sentenced to imprisonment then he or she has been disqualified to become a legislator from the date of such conviction and he or she shall continue to be discontinued to become a legislator further for a period of 6 years since he or she released from prison okay so to put simply if the punishment is a fine the 6 year period will run from the date of conviction but if there is a prison sentence the disqualification will begin on the date of conviction and will continue up to the completion of 6 years after the date of release from jail see note this point very very important they might ask question in the preliminary examination regarding this okay so these are the two categories of disqualification upon conviction here you should also note that all other criminal provisions except we have seen above will form a separate category as per section 8 clause 3 of the rpa in the context of other criminal provisions the mere conviction will not entail disqualification and a sentence of at least 2 years in prison is needed to incur such disqualification 
so i hope you got a broader idea about conviction and disqualification now moving on to see about the legal protection for legislators against disqualification see until 2013 Under Section 8, Clause 4 of the RPA, legislator could avoid immediate disqualification. This provision said that the disqualification of a member of parliament or a state legislator will not take effect for three months. Also, within those three month period, the convicted legislator files an appeal or revision application in the court. The disqualification will not take effect until the disposal of the appeal or revision application by the court. In other words the mere filing of an appeal against conviction will operate as a stay against disqualification make note of this point but in the famous lily thomas versus union of india case the supreme court declared clause 4 of the section 8 of rpa as unconstitutional and subsequently struck down it so it removed the protection enjoyed by lawmakers okay So if a question arises in preliminary examination that an appeal against conviction will operate as a stay against disqualification that statement is wrong okay now finally let us see whether the disqualification can be removed or not see the supreme court has the power to stay not only the sentence but also the conviction of a person in some rare cases conviction has been stayed to enable the appealant to contest an election However the Supreme Court has made it clear that such a stay of conviction should be very rare and for special reasons only also the RPA 1951 itself provides a remedy through the election commission see under section 11 of the act the election commission may recall reasons for committing such offenses by the legislators and it also has the power to either remove or reduce the period of a person's disqualification know that earlier the election commission exercised this power for sikkim chief minister ps tamang who served a one year sentence for corruption here the election commission reduced the period of his disqualification so as to contest in a by election and remain in the office so that's all about this news article discussion in this news article discussion we saw the depths and lengths of disqualification of legislators who are convicted on criminal charges see there might be a preliminary question regarding this topic and if it is not asked in the prelims question then very fine make note of all these points and use it in your mains answer in gs paper 2 there is a exclusive keyword in which questions are asked about rp act okay so these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion see this news article reports as that the forest department has installed artificial intelligence enabled surveillance camera system in idiki now this is done to monitor the presence of wild animals near human settlements and the system aims to provide real time warning of wild animal presence to reduce the man animal conflict what an wise initiative right this pilot initiative has been established with assistance from the united nation development program that is undp so this is about the news article given here Since we have seen significant application of AI in this discussion we will concentrate on the application part of AI. Firstly let us see the application in education. See artificial intelligence can help educators with non educational tasks like automating personalized message to students, back office task and etc like that. And AI also helps in educational task also like digitalization of content in video lecture conference and textbook guides can be made using artificial intelligence secondly let us see the application in agriculture see artificial intelligence is used to identify and detect nutrient deficiencies in the soil ai can analyze where weeds are grown ai boards can help to harvest crops at a higher volume and faster pace than human laborers thirdly application in healthcare here ai's application is diverse ai applications are used in healthcare to build sophisticated machines that can detect diseases and identify cancer cells artificial intelligence can help analyze chronic conditions with lab data to ensure early diagnosis ai can use the combination of historical data and medical intelligence for the discovery of new drugs so much and so on fourthly let us see the application in travel and transport 
See, AI is capable of doing various travel related works like making travel arrangements, suggesting the hotels, flights and better routes to the customers. Travel industries are using AI powered chatbots which can make human like interaction with consumers for better and fast response. And finally, let us see the application in robotics. See, usually general robots are programmed such that they can perform some repetitive task. But with the help of AI, we can create intelligent robots which can perform tasks with their own experiences without pre-programming. Humanoid robots are best example of AI in robotics. Many intelligent humanoid robots have been developed. Some examples include Erika and Sophia. They have been developed such that they can talk and behave like humans. ISRO has also developed a half humanoid to fly abroad unmanned test missions ahead of the Gaganyan human space flight mission. So that's all you have to know about this artificial intelligence. Very very important topic. Since it is an evolving topic, there might be a question in preliminary examination regarding its applications. That is why I chose this article. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is the preliminary practice questions. Now look at this first question. This question is with respect to herons. Statement 1. Herons are water birds which live only in tropical temperature. Statement 2. White bellied heron is found in South India. Which of the statements given above is or are correct? Option A 1 only, Option B 2 only, Option C both 1 and 2 and Option D neither 1 nor 2. See the correct answer for the question is Option D neither 1 nor 2. Both the statements are incorrect. See as we saw in the discussion itself, heron or birds which live closely to area which have water. They are a type of water fowls. So they not only live in tropical waters but also found in regions with temperate climate. So obviously statement 1 is incorrect. Statement 2 is also incorrect because white bellied heron is a special type of heron found in the northeastern part of Indian subcontinent. To be more precise, they are found in Arunachal Pradesh, Bhutan and Myanmar. They are nearly in a state of extinction. Now pause the video and have a look at this infographics. Here note that this species is frequently seen in the news so kindly make a note of it. So here the statement says that the heron is found in South India so this statement is incorrect. Okay. So the correct answer for the question is option D neither 1 nor 2. Now look at the second question. This question is about ethanol. With reference to ethanol consider the following statements. Statement 1 it is a type of biofuel. Statement 2 procurement price of ethanol from the producers has been fixed by the union government. And statement 3 Indian government has fixed the target year as 2030 to achieve ethanol blending target of 20 percentage. So here you have to choose the correct answer. Option A 1 only, option B 1 and 2 only, option C 1 and 3 only and option D all 1, 2, 1, 3. See the correct answer here is option B 1 and 2 only. Statement 1 is correct because ethanol is a type of biofuel. Let me explain to you. Biofuel is produced from biomass. It is derived from animal waste, plants, oil etc. Biofuels can be in liquid, solid and gaseous states. And ethanol is a type of biofuel. So statement 1 is correct. Statement 2 is also correct because this we saw in our newspaper discussion itself, right? ISMA wanted the government to revise the procurement price of ethanol from them. So it is actually fixed by union government. So statement 2 is correct. Now the statement 3 given here is incorrect because Indian government earlier this year said that it will be preponing the target year from 2030 to 2025 for ethanol blending target of 20 percentage. So the correct answer for this question is option B 1 and 2 only. Now moving on this question is a previous question which was asked in the year 2020 ask about the application of artificial intelligence. So now try to answer this question in the comment section. So the two main questions displayed here are the practice main questions for you today. Just go through the question, write an answer and post it in the comment section. So with this we came to the end of the news article discussion. If you like the video hit like, do comment and don't forget to subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.